thank you very much for, for the introduction and for this invitation. Um, I will be, um, so as the, somebody asked the previous, uh, to the previous speaker, there are different ways of uh, addressing robotics. One is a very utilitarian way of uh, doing robotics, so you build robots to solve real world problems. Another way is uh, to use robots as a model to, a sort of models to investigate biological questions, including cognitive questions such as consciousness. Now, I cannot really tell much about consciousness, but um, what I, I, I decided to do in this talk is to take the second approach, so to show to you how we can use um, robots to address some biological questions. And instead of focusing on one or two or three specific examples of uh, robots that may have evolved some sort of relatively complex cognitive functions, I decided to show to you many cases of robots that we have been evolving in the lab and some of these uh, uh, cases are more sophisticated than others. And it's a little bit up to you to see uh, what we can uh, do with this approach, how far we can go, and whether some of these robots may start to manifest some of the um, um, ingredients that we need or that we think are necessary to, uh, for the evolution of consciousness. My stand on, on this problem is that nothing makes sense except in the light of evolution as uh, it has already been said uh, uh, in the past. So my laboratory um, is very active in many aspects of robotics, the utilitarian aspects of robotics. So this is an artistic view of what we want to do. Uh, we focus quite a lot on biomimetic approaches and we develop uh, a lot of flying robots, although you will see very few flying robots in my presentation on evolutionary robotics today, because for technical reasons it's difficult to evolve them. And, um, and I'm interested also in the evolutionary approach, the design of robots and control systems. Okay, so Iman Harvey made an excellent uh, uh, job this morning in explaining the, uh, the basic evolutionary cycle that we use in evolutionary robotics, and I want to repeat that. I want to show to you, however, an example of how you can apply that, that evolutionary loop to a very simple robot. Imagine that you have a robot, uh, a circular robot, and you want to evolve the capability of doing collision-free navigation. You start with a generation of random genomes corresponding to different control systems, and one of the main ingredients is that all the robots in the initial population have diverse uh, genotypes and diverse behaviors. So you see here two robots of the first generation. The second, the first one was rotating on the spot. The second one rotates on the spot, goes towards uh, an obstacle. This one, since the goal, the reproduction criteria is to avoid obstacles, will have less offspring. And this guy doesn't, uh, will not make any offspring because it doesn't move. Actually, it follows uh, my hand. So it does the opposite of the reproduction criteria. Now, if you let evolution select the best individuals out of the uh, men in the population after a few generations, which in this case is 24 hours of evolution on the robot, you get, uh, you find individuals like this that have a neuronal system that has not been designed, it has been evolved, capable of uh, smoothly moving around the environment. So in most, actually, in all the experiments that we'll be showing from now on, including in this one, um, the, the genotype of the robot encodes the topology and the, um, uh, the strength and the parameters of artificial neuronal networks which are caricatures of the real nervous system, as Inman uh, put it very nicely before. Nonetheless, um, uh, it is a distributed system. It's capable of some, in some cases, of synaptic plasticity. It has a lot of dynamics and uh, memories that can uh, encode states of the system, encode variables of, of, of the system as it moves around, which may eventually um, be interpreted, uh, depending on your um, a stand on this as a, a representation planning consciousness. Now let's take, one of the beautiful things about evolution is that the role of the human designer uh, can be reduced to a very minimum. And, um, and, uh, and the environment and the robot morphology and sensors can play a very important role in the results that you get out of this evolutionary process. So let's now take the same robot and put it in a different environment, which unfortunately you cannot see here because of the lighting. We have an environment where the, um, the same robot you've seen before can, uh, if the robot goes to that uh, black spot on the top corner there, it can recharge its own battery. It's, uh, the robot has virtual batteries that, has a, that have a duration of approximately 20 seconds. If the robot does not go on the black spot after 20 seconds, it dies and uh, uh, it can no longer accumulate fitness by moving the wheels and avoiding the, the walls. However, if the robot happens to go on the black spot, it will continue to accumulate energy or fitness point for reproduction, if you like, by moving it, by recharging the battery and uh, moving um, in the environment and avoiding all the walls. 
So you, we use the same uh, reproduction criteria, fitness function, as we did earlier on. We monitor the uh, position of the evolving robots with a sort of GPS, internal GPS. And uh, what you find is that uh, after 240 generations, it's a bit longer than the previous evolutionary case, we find a robot that uh, if you put anywhere in the environment, it will move around the, the environment. It will not go to recharge its batteries. But it will go to recharge its batteries just approximately two seconds before the batteries are expired. If it goes to the recharging station, it does not stay in the recharging station. It goes out of the recharging station and it keeps moving around while avoiding the, the walls. So this robot somehow has developed the capability of uh, uh, locating where the battery charger is, and it's not a trivial task because from the sensor's perspective of the robot, the, uh, there is not a very nice gradient of light. The robot has somehow many areas in the environment look the same, so the robot has somehow to encode where it has been before and keep a trace of the trajectory it has kept. And, uh, and the question is, uh, you know, how does the robot do it? Since we are monitoring the position of the robot as it moves around the evolved robot, we can also monitor the activity of some of the internal neurons. These are neurons that are not correct, co connected directly to the motors and to the environment, that, but they just have internal dynamics. And to make a long story short, what you see here is the activity map of one of these particular neurons. When the, you see the, the, the grade levels indicate the activity level of that neuron, depending on where the robot is in the environment. So the square is the environment. And for example, if the robot is uh, here, that neuron will have a very high activity rate. You see white means high activity rate. Instead, when the uh, robot is in the top corner on the left, which corresponds to the charging station, that neuron will have a very low activity level. And what you see is that uh, if we repeat the measures of the activity of this neuron as the robot freely moves in the environment, we see that First of all, this neuron does not change its activity level uh, depending on the charge of the battery. So the, this neuron does not respond at all to the, uh, to the battery level, which is strange because the battery level is the most important indicator for the survival of the organism. However, this neuron changes its activity pattern depending on whether the robot is facing the charging station here or facing um, um, the, um, the opposite corner. So depending on whether it's facing the battery station, depending on whether it's facing the opposite corner, this neuron will have different states. And what this neuron does is that it encodes the location of the robot in the environment. As a matter of fact, the robot will always approach the charging station through this gate. It will never approach the charging station from these areas so where you see the white walls, if you like. It's a sort of a, a neuron that encodes the location, like a sort of play cells that encodes the location of where the robot is. And as soon as the robot faces with its sensors the opposite side of the charging station, this neuron will change the activity level and it, it basically encodes the distance of the robot from the charging station. As the robot moves far away from the charging station, it is telling the robot, look, you're moving farther away, farther away. As soon as the robot moves back and <coughs> faces the charging station, this neuron will tell the robot how to drive safely towards the charging station. So this is not a place cell neuron, as people have found in the rat hippocampus, but it is a neuron that um, um, encodes the locations of the robot in the environment, and therefore, computationally speaking, it, uh, um, uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, it does the same thing as the place cells do. And this happens simply by putting a robot within a neuronal network and evolving this robot in a situation where the robot has to locate a strategic location in the environment and periodically go back to that strategic location in order to ensure its own survival. Now, this robot has no vision. It only has light sensors that are not capable of, if you like, uh, uh, um, establish correlations among, the, among themselves. Now, we know that a lot of uh, interesting, at least for us, uh, forms of life in this planet use light, as it has been already said yesterday. And if you, if you use light and if you are capable of looking far away and uh, distant in the environment, you may start to um, uh, be able to catch or to um, um, uh, discover correlations that may enable more complex behaviors. Now, what we are going to do here now is to evolve robots that have a camera. This is a very... Um, a primitive sort of camera, it's a linear camera, it's a one single camera despite the two holes, 
Uh, in one of these two holes, there is a chip that sim simply detects the overall um, intensity of the light in the environment, and it adapts the sensitivity of another camera, which is sitting in the other hole. And that camera has one array of 64 pixels spanning 36 degrees visual field. It's a black and white camera. So what you see here, this robot now is looking at the black stripe here on a white wall. So all the pixels are very active on the different sides, and here you see the black stripe. Now we know that all the animals on this planet are not interested in absolute uh, light intensities. What they are interested in is discontinuities or contrast. So the very first thing that we do is that we apply a Laplace filter. It's a mathematical operation that allows the ro this robot to detect only the areas of contrast. And the areas of contrast are here. We then simply take the absolute values of this area of contrast, and we send these values as activities, as pulses, to the internal neuronal system that eventually will uh, affect the speed of the wheels of this robot. Um, we, here we are going to evolve a different type of neural, neuronal network, which is much closer to biology. It's called the spiky neuronal network. It has complex dynamics. And we know the spiky neuronal networks have, uh, are interesting because they are biologically plausible, but they are also very difficult to design by hand. So what we decided to do is to investigate the question that we were asking was whether spiking a neuronal network would use um, um, spike in time as a way of communicating with each other, or they would use a, a firing rate, which is a, a big debate in the neuroscience community. I won't go into the detail of this. I simply want to show to you that if you evolve, um, if you encode in the genotype the topology of this neuronal network and some of the parameters of these spiking neurons, uh, you put the robot in this arena, you use exactly the same fitness function as for the previous robot that I've shown earlier. Then, after only a few generations, approximately 40, uh, you will get a robot that uses vision to locate the distance from the walls and uh, safely navigate around this environment. Now, in order to, you can solve this problem in a very simple way. If the stripes are all, have all the same size, the robot will use the distance between the stripes as a proxy uh, to the distance to the wall. So in order to evolve a non-trivial behavior, you have to have uh, irregular spacing of the stripes. So the robot cannot count on that sort of invariance. Now we had this robot, and then we looked, just to give you a, a feeling of what happens inside the brain of these robots, we wanted to understand whether these neurons were using a firing sp um, uh, rate or um, a firing time as a way of communicating with each other. So we had 10 internal neurons, you see them on the top columns, and we counted the spikes per second as the robot was moving around. And we saw that they have very different variety of spiking rates from very high, almost bursting rate to almost, uh, to basically zero activity. Some of the neurons were not active at all while the robot was moving around the environment. So then we looked at the interspike variability. So whether the uh, spiking is, um, uh, is periodic or whether it is spread across multiple uh, time intervals. And we saw that some of these neurons had a very um, diversified spiking rate, whereas other neurons were spiking a very periodic intervals. So we thought, OK, if we lesion the neurons that spike at, with a very high variability, probably the robot will not be able to perform the task anymore. Uh, as it is doing now, and it was not true. So uh, the, 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 the high variability or diversity in the spiking rate was not what was really math, uh, counting in this rubber. And then we found that um, we could kill or, or lesion 30% of the uh, activities, 30% of the neurons in this brain, and uh, leave the robot with intact behavioral capabilities if we killed only the neurons that uh, were spiking in a way that was not correlated with the spiking activities of the postsynaptic neurons. In other ways, there are a few neurons out here. Some of them, there are three neurons actually. Uh, it's one, five, and seven. That whenever they spike, their spiking activity is never correlated with the spiking activity of the neurons they connect to. If you lesion those neurons, independent of their activity, then you get the robot that despite having 30% of the neuronal mass less than the original evolved robot, is still capable of moving around. And now you see that the only difference is that the behavior of this robot is a little bit more, uh, is, uh, less smooth. But of course, if you take 30% of your dynamics of the brain out, you depend much more on the sensory experience that you get. And therefore, this robot is much more reactive to whatever it, uh, it perceives. 
but still it can move around. So it seems that the correlation of spiking activities in evolved spiking neurons plays a very important role, at least in this case. We then said, okay, well, let's, can we evolve a, 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 using the same fitness function, the same spiking neuronal network, can we evolve a control system for a robot that has more complex dynamics than a robot standing on the wheels? And uh, for doing that, for testing this, whether we could do that, we took a blimp, a small zeppelin, if you like, and uh, we equipped the zeppelin with the cameras uh, in the front, exactly the same type of camera. We just changed the lenses so that the field of view uh, was much larger. Instead of 36 degrees, it's 150 degrees, which you may need if you have a large body and if you have very complex dynamics. You want to see, be able to see quite a lot around yourself. And uh, we repeated the experiment in a room. So the robot had batteries that lasted only four hours. And we, everything was uh, running, the evolution was running in the microcontroller that was sitting on the, on the robot itself. And I only had the student going every four hours to change the battery of the robot and uh, let it evolve indoor. Now, how do you measure the fitness of a, of a flying robot? If you, have a, if you have a robot on wheel, you can measure whether the robot is moving out and avoiding obstacles by using the odometers or encoders of the wheels. And you can use sensors, contact sensors, to know whether it has collided or not. With a flying robot, it's more complex. So what we came up with is that we equip the robot with an anemometer on, in the front. It's this one. The anemometer is a passive propeller. As the robot moves, flies uh, forward, the, the anemometer will turn in one direction. If the, and the rotational speed of the anemometer is proportional to the speed of the robot, to the translational speed of the robot. If the robot stops or if the robot moves in one direction or the other, or it bumps into an obstacle, the anemometer won't spin anymore. So the fitness of this robot, or the criteria for selection, is simply the amount of uh, rotations that the anemometer has made over a fixed amount of time, which is two minutes for this case. Every individual lived only for two minutes, and it had to maximize the rotational speed of the anemometer in one direction. And only after uh, approximately 50 generations, that was in this case, uh, I think, three days of evolution, you can see our robot. It can uh, uh, very nicely fly around this arena using only the visual information. The robot has very complex dynamics, so if you can imagine that you can only look in the front, uh, it's amazing how uh, accurate the neuronal network is in, if you like, controlling or taking care of the, the dynamics of this robot. If you, we can look at this robot flying from the side here. Here you see the actual the anemometer is the, this one on the bottom. You see it's not on the front as in the drawing. The anemometer is the, the one on the bottom, that uh, passive propeller there. Uh, you can see that the robot not only avoids the walls, but avoids anything that uh, you can put in front of it. So I have a student standing there. Uh, maybe I show to you. We can put a, a, a hand in front of the camera of the robot, and the robot will try to fly in order to avoid the hand. And you can also do one thing. You can put the robot in against the wall, and you will see that the robot will move backward, and then it will resume the flight and fly on. So there has been no design by human here. It's a simply evolved a control system that has a slightly more complicated neural network that takes into account all the constraints of its morphology. You can also. Uh, uh, shrink the whole approach and, uh, and use it in, uh, uh, for much smaller robots, but I, I will skip this. It's just the same thing. So we do also artificial evolution on um, sugar cube-sized robots. Uh, everything runs on board, and, uh, and, uh, but, but I'll, I'll skip this, and I will move up to, to a different example. Active vision. So, so far, the visual system of the robot was solidal with the uh, body of the robot. But many animals are capable of looking around and deciding what we look at. So we may decide that uh, uh, we look in that direction before actually moving in the direction. So we can do active exploration of our environment. And uh, this is a quite powerful uh, um, capability, sensory motor capability that we have. So what we decided to do was to investigate um, the role of active vision uh, using an evolutionary approach again. We took a mobile wheeled robot here. It's slightly larger than the previous one. Uh, we equipped it with a Sony uh, pan tilt camera. So the camera can uh, do a pan and a tilt. And they can also zoom in and out. And, uh, and we had a, a simple neuronal system that uh, received uh, uh, input from a set of neurons 
uh, whose receptive fields were spanning the entire field or a portion of the field of view of the camera. We had proprioceptive sensors, uh, just like any animal has, about the position of the eyes in the head and about the head position of the head in the body. And these uh, proprioceptive sensors were telling the robot uh, the neuronal network, the pan and tilt angle of the camera. And then we had some memory units, so neurons that encode the internal dynamics of the of the robot. And the output units of this evolved neuronal network were not only controlling the wheels of the robot, but also controlling the pan, the tilt, and the zoom in and zoom out of the camera. So the robot could at the same time move and decide where to look at, which would affect the sensory input that the robot receives. Now, if you put the robot in, a, in an environment like this, in an office, and then we use the same fitness function we have used so far for all the robots I've shown so far, um, you see that the robot has, therefore, to, it can maximize the fitness by moving around this environment. So the fitness is maximized if it can manage to move forward the speed of the wheels, uh, to move forward the, the body by counting the rotation of the two, uh, the two wheels. But you can see that the robot can look at many different things here with the camera in the office. Uh, it can look at many different things, like people passing by, like the window, uh, like this. But in fact, the robot has to, can only move within this very small confined space. So the question is, what will the robot look at? And uh, so we, we started evolution, and as you're going to see, oops, uh, as you're going to see here in the video, some of the individuals in the initial generation, they do not, uh, they pay attention to things that are not relevant for the task. So this robot is paying attention to the sun coming through the light, through the window. This is interesting, but it doesn't help the robot to move around, avoiding the, the walls. So this robot will make very few offspring for the next generation. Then you have a robot here that always looks up. And then here I'm filming the robot with the camera. And the camera is on a black pole, like that one. And as soon as the robot can see this black stick, this feature, this black feature, will stop at it, look at the camera. But this is not good enough for moving around. And then you see that after a few generations, the best evolved robots, uh, what they do is that they look at the edge between the wall, the white wall on the ground, and the floor. And they always keep track of this edge. And they also sometimes look ahead, because this is the most informative piece of information you have in this environment to know how far you are from the wall and uh, to move ahead. And sometimes they also turn the camera, when they turn to the right, they move the camera to the right to see if there is any obstacle and then they keep track, they focus back again on the edge. So it's a quite interesting uh, sensory motor coordination here, the, which is uh, effective. And we also did experiments outdoor in a number of different environments. We can now start to change the body of the robot and go for more complex robots like humanoids. Now here again, we humanoids have, um, in this case, we were looking with a, uh, we were working with the Fujitsu robot. and. Uh, the robot has a pan tilt camera. Now, the, one of the interesting things about uh, leg locomotion is that as you move, the entire environment moves very uh, dynamically. So either you keep your head or you keep your gaze fixed on some object, or everything will move around. And the question is, how can a, a neuronal system cope with this very uh, dynamic uh, behavior? So Evolving a control system for a humanoid robot is not possible in reality because you would break the mechanics very easily. Evolution operates by uh, repetitive uh, tests of multiple individuals. So as, if you operate with wind robot, it's OK. You can uh, run evolution for multiple days, but not with a humanoid robot. So what we did is that we used the simulator provided uh, by a company uh, for this. And we evolved in the simulation a control system for this robot that can only see uh, through this camera. So the robot is put in this simulated environment. There are a few uh, pillars or columns in the environment. And the task of the robot is to reach that window over there. So there is an opening there. So the robot has to learn how to avoid the, the pillars, locate the window, and walk towards the window with this very dynamic uh, uh, field of view. It can, the output is controlling the movement of the legs and controlling the pan, the tilt, and the zoom in and zoom out, uh, which is like the focus of attention, if you like. And um, I'll, I'll show to you, um, uh, maybe I'll show this video. What you see here is the robot perspective, what the robot looks at. This is the, the movement of the robot from the, from the top, and this is what the robot looks at. 
And for a, quite a long time, the robot moves on the spot because it has to locate where the window is. It cannot find it. As soon as it locates it, you see that it starts moving towards the window. It, now it lost the window. Now it will get a better perspective, I think. So the window now is larger. And it will start moving towards the window. And then eventually it will, it will reach the window. So you see it gets confidence and it reaches the window very easily there. So this is just to show to you that uh, uh, artificial evolution, when put in the right conditions, in the right environment, with the right type of morphology, will, it will develop, not right, with a, with a suitable type of morphology, it will develop uh, more complex uh, um, uh, strategies. You can also have fun with this. And what we did, one of my students evolved, uh, um, um, hacked a car game simulator, one of the things that you can do with the PlayStation with these games. And, um, he evolved the uh, driver. So the evolved neuronal network is sitting on the, behind the windscreen on the, at, the, at, the, at the steering wheel, and it can control the gas and brakes. What the neural network looks at is just like our eyes. You're sitting in front here. What the neural network is looking at is only this window. So this is the single eye of the neuronal network of the artificial driver. This is the uh, windscreen. And uh, as before, the evolved neuronal network can uh, control gas, the braking. It can decide where to look at, and it can zoom in and out. In other words, it can focus attention, attention on some detail or simply take a general picture. And what I show to you here is the best evolved driver. You see that uh, the, before starting, it focuses on the edge of the road, and then it accelerates. And it keeps track, basically it uses its uh, proprioceptive information of the height of the height of the of the, of the camera to decide how far away it is from the edge. Very dynamic, it's uh, extremely efficient, and it, uh, it, uh, it uh, was capable of beating the student who had been playing with this game for several weeks nonstop. <laughs> now, all the neuronal networks that I've described so far um, were not capable of learning during lifetime. So they were only evolved, and during lifetime, they, all they had was the internal dynamics provided by uh, the recurrent connections in the neuronal network. Now the question is, what happens if you uh, genetically encode this synaptic plasticity, the property of synaptic plasticity that many uh, animals have? Now, in all the experiments that I've described so far, the genetic code, which was just a string of uh, bits, as Inman was uh, describing earlier on, uh, the genetic code was encoding the strength of each individual synapse and the sign of each individual synapse. So we used, for example, five bits to encode the strength and the sign of the synapse. Now, you can use exactly the same genetic encoding, but this time, instead of encoding the strength of each synapse, you can encode the, uh, which one of the four uh, types of learning rules that have been found by neuroscientists this synapse will use to change its own strength during lifetime. So as the um, genotype is decoded into a neural network, the initial synaptic weights are randomly set, just like a newborn baby. It has connections that are established and have some random value. Or they, at least what they have is that genetically, what is genetically determined is whether the synapse is inhibitory or excitatory. That's the only thing. And then the strength of the synapse is changing during the lifetime of the individual, of the robot, as it experiences the environment using one of the four learning rules that are genetically decided by two bits. And then we have two bits that are used for uh, uh, setting the learning rate, so how quickly that synapse will change using that particular synaptic uh, rule. Now, one interesting uh, uh, result of this is that evolution can use different type of learning rules distributed over the neural network, which is very different from what uh, computational neuroscientists do, or people in neural networks. When you, people in neural networks develop a neural network, they use the same algorithm or the same uh, learning uh, rule for all the synapses in their network. Our brain uses different learning rules depending on where the neurons are sitting in the brain. So evolution here can play with different type of learning rules. So I won't go into the details of uh, these variations of learning rules, but they have all been uh, um, found in, in nature. And what we can do is that now we can repeat the same evolutionary experiments that I've shown to you in the first slide, where the robot had to do collision-free avoidance in the looping maze. Now, we evolved the robot this time with this synaptic plasticity. And what you see here, um, uh, each of the bars is the axis that connect the two wheels of the robot. 
and I plot the position of the robot, the segment, the, the, the axis between the two the wheels, every 100 milliseconds. So what you see here is the trajectory of the robot plotted every 100 milliseconds. The robot, the evolved robot, is put first against the uh, wall in the middle of the looping maze. And as you see, during the first uh, few seconds of its lifetime, it just keeps colliding with this obstacle. And after some time, as you will see in the video, um, I don't have the video, but after some time, the robot moves backward, and then it starts uh, moving around the looping maze. This is the second loop it does. And you see that the behavior of the robot, which is capable of learning during lifetime using the evolved learning rules, is much smoother than during the first loop. So this is the same robot at the beginning of its lifetime, so to speak, and at the end of its lifetime. Now, since this robot is capable of, uh, of uh, learning during lifetime, we can now test it in a different environment. So we put the same robot in this environment. To you, it may look similar, but for the robot, it's very different because the lighting condition is uh, uh, different, so there is a much more infrared light uh, in this environment, which affects quite a lot the sensor of the robot. The walls are made of wood instead of polystyrene, as in the evolved robot, so this changes the reflective properties. And third, the geometry of the environment is very different from the looping base. These are all the three things you can change and that can make things go wrong in a hand-designed robot. Now, if we take that evolved robot, we reinitialize the synapses to small random values, and we let the robot learn again, without evolving it, you will see that at the beginning it collides with the walls. So it's like a newborn baby, if you like. And after some time, it keeps moving forward. And you will see that the number of collisions decrease over time as the robot follows the walls. Now, this robot here is the same robot that you see here, but the, its behavioral strategy is very different. Instead of doing wall avoidance, it does wall following which for roboticists are two different coding strategies or very different behaviors or very different problems. So the same robot put in a different environment learns, so to speak, or develops, so to speak, different um, behavioral strategies. Okay, now let's look at one of the uh, most difficult problems that I have given robots so far using the evolutionary approach. And this is a sequential task. What we do is that we put the robot in this arena. The robot has a vision system, has the same linear camera we've seen before. And it can, it, its lifetime is uh, two or five minutes. I don't remember how much we, it's a robot, every robot was tested two or five minutes. And it can gain fitness points only if it is sitting under this light bulb where the gray area is, uh, when the light bulb is on. Now the problem is, as the robot starts its lifetime, the light bulb is off. And in order to switch the, so if the robot goes to, the, to this gray area when the light bulb is off, there is no fitness point to be gained. The only way to switch the light bulb on is for the robot to go here towards this light switch. We can detect that the robot is on the light switch if it is sitting on this area. And then when the robot hits the light switch, then the light bulb will go on, and the robot has to go rush here and stay under the light bulb. So we, we do not program anything, we just evolve a neuronal network. And we evolve the neuronal network in two conditions. One, where the same genetic string encodes only for the synaptic strength and the robot cannot learn in during the lifetime. And two, when the robot can uh, use the same genetic string to encode the synaptic learning rules so the robot can learn during lifetime. And we want to see, first, will evolution come up with a behavior or with a strategy that is capable of solving this problem, so learning that the robot has to do something here to go to the light switch before it can go to the fitness, to, to the light bulb. And second, is there a difference in uh, uh, whether evolution can manipulate uh, the capability of learning during lifetime? Uh, we use a very uh, uh, fully connected neural networks, and first of all, if you simply look at the fitness or the, the performance of the evolved robots in the two conditions, over generations, you see no difference. So these are generations on the uh, x-axis, and on the y-axis is the fitness or performance of the evolved robot. When we evolve the weights and the robot does not learn, or where we evolve the learning rules, uh, but not the initial weights, you see that more or less the fitness is the same. So you would say, well, that's not a big difference. Well, yes, you see, if you evolve the learning rules, the robot uh, reaches performance levels much earlier 
than uh, in the case where you simply evolve the fixed weights. And two, there is a small uh, performance difference. But the big thing is how the robots solve the problem. If we take the best evolved robot in the case of um, um, uh, when you evolve the, uh, the weights but not the, the robot cannot learn, you see that what the robot does is that it does sort of a stereotypical uh, behaviors. It basically performs loops in the environment. It avoids the walls. We know that evolution can come up with uh, collision-free uh, navigation. And eventually, by using this minimalistic strategy, it will end up on the light switch. The light will go on, and then the robot displays a, um, a looping uh, trajectory that is oriented towards the light bulb, and it will stay there. It's a very simple way and efficient to solve the problem, which many insects may use. Now, the situation is very different when the robot cannot encode in its own weights the geometry of the environment and cannot encode uh, the, uh, the reaction to the, to the environment. It has to learn, if you like, on the spot how to solve the problem. And it learns it very differently. So what this uh, robot does, when it, it starts with the random synapses, so at the beginning its behavior is, is still uh, quite primitive, and then very quickly, as it is exposed to the light uh, switch, it becomes attracted to the light switch, and then it starts, as, you, as it moves, it becomes attracted to the, to the light, and then it will go very straight towards the light. Now, how can we test whether this behavior is really different from the one on the left? Well, we can change the environment and see how the two robots perform. And as I said, one way of changing the environment for these robots is to change the color of the walls. Now, if we change the color of the walls of the robot that has been evolved without a learning capability, this is the evolutionary environment that the robot has seen for many generations. Here, the robot is capable of doing its minimalistic behavior and going towards the light, light bulb. We change the color of the walls. You see the robot hits the wall and is not capable of moving away from it. Again, here, we change the color again. The robot is not capable of adapting to the new colors of the walls. So it hits the walls before, uh, um, so the, if you like, the sensory motor coordination is broken. It cannot anymore adapt to it. We take the robot where, uh, that is capable of uh, learning during lifetime, and you see that no matter what the color of the walls is, it will still solve, display the same uh, sort of strategy. We can also do a much more complex and tricky thing, is that we can change the layout of the environment. So this is the environment that the robot has been experiencing during evolution. The light switch is here, the light bulb is here. These are two fundamental landmarks for its performance. Now what we do is that we put the light switch here and the light bulb here. And we, that you see that the genetically determined individual is revealed. It does this minimalistic looping <coughs> behaviors and it will never end up on the light bulb. Instead, our adaptive individual, it will avoid the walls, locate the light switch, and then go towards the light bulb. We can even change the embodiment. So I should say, we are not evolving individuals again. We take the evolved individual and we test it in different environments. We can take, we can disembody the evolved brains and transfer to a different robot. So we take the robot you've seen before with the six wheels and with a very different morphology, and we take the two evolved brains, the non-adaptive and the adaptive, we put it in this robot in a scaled up version of the environment, and you see that the genetically determined robot will just keep moving with, with its looping uh, uh, mazes and will not be able to solve the problem and gain fitness. Instead, the evolved individual will find, will adapt to this new morphology, will go towards the light switch, and then will go towards the light. Now, what this robot does is that you see that it moves backward and then it periodically returns to the light switch. And this is why we realized, we said, why doesn't the robot simply stay here? Because the wheels, the rubber wheels of this robot are um, a little bit uh, outside the chassis. So as the robot approaches the wall with a small angle, it will climb up the wall, it will go back, and then it will keep forward, moving forward, and it will try to go back to the light switch. That's the thing it didn't adapt to. So it's not perfect, but almost. So what you can see here is that evolution came up with something that is quite powerful. It, it solves a sequential problem. Uh, where we do not provide intermediate rewards for solving parts of the problem, and uh, it can solve it in a variety of different environments. So how many minutes do I have? Do I have? Five minutes. So I'll skip the predator prey uh, things. Uh, I want to talk to you about, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the evolution of altruistic uh, behavior 
and communication. Because we said consciousness is about sentience, is about uh, uh, living in an environment with other individuals. Now, a very strong form of uh, social uh, behavior is altruistic behavior. When you are ready to sacrifice, to pay a cost uh, for the good of your uh, community. Now, when we are talking of, of the problem in terms of evolution, in, or in evolutionary terms, it means that you, uh, the cost is that you, you have a lower probability of transmitting your genes for the next generations. And then uh, the evolution of altruistic behavior is a problem for Darwinian theory, or at least the vanilla type of Darwinian theory, because Darwin said that, uh, or well, not, not Darwin said, but the, uh, the vanilla interpretation of evolution is that individuals should always maximize the probability of transmitting their own genes to the next generation. Now, there are two hypotheses that biologists came up with that could explain the evolution of genetic, of altruistic behavior, where, where an individual is ready to sacrifice uh, its own uh, reproduction uh, for the community. One is the theory of genetic relatedness, and to make a story short, put forward by um, Bill Hamilton in 1964, the theory says that uh, the more genetically related you are uh, to your uh, team members, the more likely you are to display um, uh, altruistic behavior because although you do not, uh, although you decrease your probability of transmitting your own genes to the next generations, you increase by your altruistic behavior, you increase the uh, fitness of your team member who is very likely to carry the same genes as you have and therefore you can indirectly transmit your genes to the next generation by favoring your kin. There is another theory instead, the theory of group selection that says, look, it's not necessary to be genetic related to evolve uh, altruistic behavior. All you need is to be able to work together uh, with diverse individuals in a team to be very complementary. And if as a team together you can perform a task much better than another competing team then, as a whole, all the team members will have higher probability of surviving, getting access to food, and transmitting their own genes to the next generation. Now, these two theories have, um, have had uh, highs and lows over history, and, uh, but there is no fossil record in, uh, in evolution, and so uh, it's not so clear how we can, uh, and it's very difficult to do uh, evolution of uh, biological organisms because it takes a long time, especially if they are so sophisticated to to live in colonies. And so what we decided to do is to test the two theories. We came up with uh, two ways of doing, uh, designing the evolutionary uh, approach so that we have either homogeneous genetically related uh, teams of robots or genetically unrelated or heterogeneous teams of robots. And what we can decide is that we either select robots as a team, as in group selection uh, uh, you would do, or we select individuals uh, independently of whether the team, whether they belong to the team or the other. So, to make again a long story short, we can test whether either the theory of group selection or the theory of genetic relatedness, and we can see out of these four conditions, um, in which cases the robot display altruistic operation. Uh, in the environment is very important, so to, to test this theory, we came up with this uh, foraging arena a set of small robots that have vision and have in distance sensor of various types are put in this arena and they are presented with two types of food tokens. They are big food tokens and small food tokens. A small food token can be taken, okay, the robots can, imagine this is food, this food can be consumed only if the robots are capable of moving the food towards this wall. You don't see it in the video so well, but the wall is wide. So the robots can distinguish this white wall against the black walls, the other three black walls. And if the robots uh, can manage to put the food here, to take the food here, with a, an external camera, we can detect whether this has happened, and we can tell that the corresponding robot has gained fitness point or energy, which is good for the production. Now, a small food token can be taken to the nest, this white wall, only by a single robot. And the robot can feed on it, and it will consume the entire energy of the, of the food token. Now, you also have big food tokens. The big food tokens contain enough energy for the entire colony. However, so if, if a big food token is taken towards the nest, everybody, every robot in the, in the colony will get enough energy. It will gain, like, just like ants, they, get, they can take a big prey towards the nest and everybody can feed on it. However, in order to push the big food token towards the nest, it takes at least two or three robots because they are very heavy. 
Now, there is a cost to pay. So you can either be selfish here and say, you know, I take the small food token, I eat my own, my own food, I don't care of the other. Or you can be selfish and you can decide to go towards the big food token and hope that somebody else comes along and helps you. And the, the cost to pay here is that, as you will going to see in the video in a moment, to push a big food token towards the nest takes a lot of uh, time. So the robots have a limited lifetime, so it takes a lot of time. Two, it's not guaranteed to succeed because of physical interferences. And three, if the other robots do not help, you spend your entire life waiting for somebody else to help, and you will never get victim's point. So the question is, under what evolutionary conditions will robots display altruistic operation and go for uh, foraging of big food tokens rather than small food tokens? And the answer is that, of course, if you have group selection or genetic relatedness, you will get uh, uh, devolution of altruistic operation. But the most powerful um, 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 uh, condition that we found is genetic relatedness. Group selection can work, but there are a lot of uh, adverse factors that uh, affect the outcome, which include the noise in the environment, the coincidence of particular conditions for this to happen. Instead, whenever individuals are genetically related, you will always find um, um, the evolution of altruistic operation. I want to show to you here the uh, evolution of altruistic operation in the case of genetically related individuals. At the beginning, at generation zero, the robots do not even know how to move around. So here you see the nest, the white wall, and you see that the robots first, they don't even know how to coordinate their sensory perception with the motion. Sometimes they simply hit the wall, and uh, sometimes they have catatonic behavior like this. They don't move around. Now, if you wait long enough, you will see that uh, after some time, the robots display a coherent behavior, and they will forage for the foods, uh, for the food tokens. You will see that uh, uh, robots start to go for the big food tokens. They cannot move it. You get some, small rob some few robots that are selfish, and every population can withstand a certain <coughs> amount of selfish individuals. Uh, but most of the robots will go and help other robots to push the object. You see, this is a robot that encounters a small food token, but decides to avoid it to go and help these other robots that push the big food token. So you see, it's, uh, pushing a big ob obstacle like this, is a big food token, is not easy. There is a lot of in physical interference. And this is why there is a cost to pay. So um, if you are genetically related, you can evolve this type of sort of behaviors. And then we uh, tested this sort of um, uh, condition to see whether we could also explain the evolution of altruistic communication. So the evolution of communication is a big mystery. And, uh, you know, we, in particular, and there is no fossil record for communication, and in particular, it's very difficult to explain when, why people would communicate or give away information that is very precious for their own survival to other individuals. And uh, and uh, so we used robots that can communicate by means of light, the position of um, uh, objects that have the same appearance. So they, have, uh, they are this red disc here, one and two. In the photograph, this red disc looks like violet or purple, but as a matter of fact, it is red. So it's as the same red as here. Now, the, this, uh, this is poison. So if the robots go towards the poison, their fitness points will be decreased. Instead, if the robots go towards the food, their fitness points will be increased. And the robots have two choices. Uh, they can either communicate where the food or the poison is, or they can stay silent and decide to discover for themselves where the food and the poison is. And, uh, and whenever you evolve these robots under the condition of genetic relatedness, you see that the robots will start to use their colors to communicate this is a food that is poison, where the food and the poison is. You see, this robot is, this is the best evolved uh, colony. This robot goes here, and then it turns blue. And the other robots have evolved a neuronal network that understands that blue means, hey, come here. Here is the food. And you see that uh, they will start moving here towards the blue. The more blue there is, of course, the more they are attracted. And as you're going to see now, the cost in doing this is that the more robots cluster around the food, the less space there is for other robots to go there. So if you communicate where the food is, then you will get a lot of robots there, and then eventually will not get enough food. So you see a robot going here. It cannot touch the disk, so it cannot get fitness points. It tries to be there, but it cannot. But eventually you will say, you know, hey, guys, here is, the, here is food. Come here anyway. And then you've got that individual there looks lost, but eventually it will go towards the food. So, 
So this is so powerful that you can actually evolve even uh, very primitive forms of uh, uh, communication. And uh, I have many other examples with flying robots, but I think I better stop here. And thank you very much for your attention.